Hello! Welcome to Netcast Church Sermon Podcast. We exist to tell people about Jesus and connect them to the church. If you'd like to know more, visit netcastchurch.org. Enjoy! Kind of love Jason. <laughs> <laughs> so, if uh, you weren't here last week, I'm Dan. This is my wife, Kathy. Hi, everyone. We've been uh, partners at Netcast about two years. And we're uh, fortunate and blessed to uh, and really enjoy leading a uh, marriage ministry. And the focus of the marriage ministry is the importance and joy uh, in abiding. So uh, last week, we introduced some of those concepts, and we're going to do some more this week. Um, But we also gave everybody a little practice uh, exercise. Uh, Was that helpful to people? All right. uh, Who was in uh, Psalms 23? Show of hands. All right. How about Hebrews 10? Did that speak to anybody? There we go. Yeah. <laughs> and Psalms 103? Excellent. <laughs> love it. Love it, love it. Um, so this week, we are excited to keep the conversation going as we talk about the fruit that comes from abiding. Not that might come from abiding, but that is promised as we abide. So super excited to share this. Um, but just to recap, abiding, when we say that word, really all that is, guys, is intentionally connecting to a father who stinking adores you. Okay? So that's all we're talking about here, enjoying relationship with him and nurturing that relationship. Um, John 15, 1 through 5, we want to do just a quick recap for anyone um, who needs it, just to talk about what our roles are and what they're not when it comes to abiding and when it comes to bearing fruit. And uh, John 15, 1 to 5 lays out this analogy that really does this perfectly. And Jesus is speaking here, and right off the bat, he says, I am the vine. So he's telling you, I am the vine, I am the source of life. You have no way to connect to the Father without me. Just so you know, that's what Jesus is telling us, okay? So he's the vine. And then connecting to the Father, he tells us, my Father is the vine dresser. His Father, God, is the vine dresser. He's the one who makes all the decisions, who is in charge of everything, who knows what fruit he wants to grow. He knows how he needs to tend and nourish the garden, all of these things. That's great. And that brings us to us. We are just the branches. Branches are pliable, flexible, but they have one and only one job, and it's not to bear fruit. Actually, the fruit is born through Jesus, through us. But the branch's job is to simply stay connected to the vine, to Jesus, and he is the one who will bear the fruit. So why is that important? Because when we try to do it, when we try to bear fruit, guys, I don't know about you, but we're really, really bad at it if we do it on our own. (laughs) So a fruit that's uh, talked about a lot is joy. Um, and as Christians, our joy is not to be from our circumstances, but because of, of God. But does anybody wrestle with joy being in their circumstances? Anybody? Good, good. I, I'm, I'm glad I'm not the only one. So about two and a half years ago, I had this joy thing nailed. Family's doing well. Kathy's doing well. Kids are doing well. Job's good. It's Christmas time. I love that time of year. He is Father Christmas, for those who don't know. I'm more Clark Griswold, but yes. <laughs> And uh, then a little bit after Christmas, you know, joy. I'm feeling joy. I'm feeling good. A little bit after Christmas, you start hearing the news about this weird flu thing going on in China. Next thing I know, I can't go to work. We're not sure the company's going to stay open. Um, My oldest son and his wife are in Texas, not here. We're all locked down at home. I'm trying to figure out how to zoom into meetings. Um, All of a sudden, you know, there is no joy. A few days after that, that's not funny. <laughs> what's what's funny little, about no it's a joy? Little funny. <laughs> a few days after that, I found out you know our company is considered essential. We're going to stay open. Uh, Josh and Emily are back from Texas. They're here. We're all out in the yard. We're doing uh, quarantine Olympics. We're having a blast, and all of a sudden, you know, there's joy again. Yay. And that's when God hits me. Do you realize that your joy is 100% connected to your circumstances, not to me, an all-powerful God that loves you? Hmm. Um, So does anybody, can anybody else relate to that story? (laughs) What about this? Pastor Matt delivers an amazing uh, sermon. You're leaving, you're on fire, you're convicted. You are going to be more patient. You're going to just show more patience. It's, this is it. You're going to really work hard on patience. And you don't even get out of the parking lot, and some knucklehead cuts you off. You're on the horn, letting him know he's number one in your book. <laughs> 
Or do you say, you know, today's the day. I'm going to have unity in my marriage. I'm going to have unity in my family. I'm going to have unity with my relationships. And the next thing you know, you're having an argument about something stupid that doesn't even matter. <laughs> yeah, or maybe, guys, have you ever been praying so hard and so long for something, and you look around, and it feels to you like God's answering everybody's prayers besides yours? Yeah, been there too. Or is there someone in your life that you keep trying to forgive, but it's really, really hard and you can't, right? And you know as a Christian we're supposed to, so how do we do it? Or maybe today you're just sitting in a place where you really need wisdom because you are trying to do everything you can on your own to fix something, and it's going sideways and completely failing. The reason we struggle so much with all of this is mostly because most of the time we're trying to do this all on our own, and we were never designed to do it all on our own, and we come to God as a last resort. But God's word tells us that it's not up to us. In fact, so many of these things, guys, are just the promised fruit of abiding as we walk with him. So we're going to look back at John 15, 4 and 5, and just pick this apart a little bit. Jesus says in this, "'Abide in me, and I in you.'" As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Be a branch. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. It doesn't say he it is that might bear much fruit. It says he it is that will bear much fruit, guys. So if fruit is promised from abiding, what exactly is fruit? This is super simple, guys. Jesus is producing stuff, produce, in us all the time. <laughs> I got to give Matt credit for that one. I stole it from him. But um, anyway, he's producing stuff in us all the time. This can be all sorts of things. It can be joy. It can be unity. It can be we're feeling really anxious, and he just blankets us with peace, um, forgiveness. Even just laughter in family can be a fruit. Fruit is really anything God wants to produce in or through us. And without him, we can't do anything, guys. So the first fruit we want to talk about is uh, forgiveness. Now, this is a very uh, foundational fruit. If we're bearing unforgiveness, harboring unforgiveness in our hearts, it's going to, imp- it's going to restrict God from bearing fruit in us. It's going to restrict us from that uh, abundant life that he promises. Um, so this is harboring unforgiveness for others or ourselves. Uh, Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. So we forgive because Christ forgave us. We're required to do this. This isn't optional. We're required to do this. But we can't will this fruit into existence. Mm -hmm. We need God to grow this. Um, So it's a fruit from abiding. When we spend time with God, God will change our heart toward other people. As he does this, he may give us some instructions along the way. So yeah, this is something that God has um, really walked me through personally. And honestly, as new things come up with new people, new situations every day, he has to still keep walking me through this. But one sweet example I will share with you guys has to do with my dad. And um, I shared last week that I grew up in a very dysfunctional family. And for lots of reasons, the relationship with my dad was severed for a really long time. Um, When God highlighted to me that he that he saw unforgiveness in my heart and it was something he actually wanted to heal. To be honest, I didn't know, one, I didn't know how to even start. And two, I didn't know if I wanted him to. I didn't know if I wanted to go there with him. Um, But he continued to just gently show me how toxic the unforgiveness was and that it was a place that if I let it stay there, it was going to grow into this root of bitterness and and it was going to steal everything he really had for me. Um... So there are years worth of baby steps that he led me on, and I'm not going to bore you with all of the baby steps of that, but there was a process. I do want to share, however, the starting point that he took me to to start to grow this forgiveness, just in case one of you is sitting in that same place right now, and maybe this will speak to you and just get you started on the road. And this is, I heard a pastor suggest, when God, after God, shortly after God laid this on my heart, I heard a pastor suggest, start praying for whoever it is you need to forgive for five minutes a day. To be honest, I listened to that and thought, yeah. <laughs> That's super trite, super simple, and okay, sure, I've got nothing to lose, I might as well try it. But here was the reality. After about 30 seconds of praying for my dad, 
that kind of covered the surface level things. It covered the fluffy stuff. And then I got like four and a half minutes left that I somehow have to pray for something else. And God started showing me the desires that he had for my dad, who he saw him as. And in that moment, he really began to work this new thing where he showed me how to see my God for who he, my dad, for who he was and not just for how he was. And that's really what started moving my heart towards forgiveness. God really continued this layer by layer, um, teaching me how to forgive my dad. And then fast forward several years, and in 2020, my dad passed away, actually. Um, He was super sick during that time. And what was so sweet, though, because God had laid this foundation, had started growing this forgiveness in me, um, I was able to tend to him in a way during that season that there is no way except by God's power that I really could have. Um, Physically caring for him, just speaking life to him and encouragement to him, um, and able to do it without expectation and honestly without even thinking, you know, not him ever asking for forgiveness. It wasn't about that at all. Um, There was something sweet and freeing about being able to do that just on God's power and because I knew God loved me and he forgave me, so I'm going to extend the same thing to this person no matter what. Um, But he did that in me, and I know not everybody has the opportunity before somebody, the offender, whoever hurt you, passes, or maybe they're, they don't even know you exist still, honestly. You never know. But, um, You don't always have that opportunity, but let me tell you, forgiveness is a heart thing between you and God. It's between you and God. You may not be able to reconcile with that person on earth. However, God can free you from that burden. He can can change your heart to be able to forgive, and it's because forgiveness is his nature. So I want everybody to think of either someone they, they need to forgive or someone maybe they've forgiven recently. Think of that person specifically. So how do you feel in your heart? Are you anxious and angry? Do you have peace? If you're anxious and angry, that means you need to spend time with God for some heart transformation. And that's okay. There's people in here right now who are being called to forgive some pretty big, terrible things. Um, But it's God's desire to release you from that anxiousness, that anger, um, and free you up so he can produce amazing fruit in your life. Yeah. For me, when God was really walking me through this, there was a quote from Bill Hybels that spoke to my heart, and so I just want to encourage you with it. And um, it says, forgiveness means we fully acknowledge the wrong done to us. We grieve over what's been lost, because that loss is real, guys. And yet, we eventually let the other person off the hook, not for their sake only, but for ours and for God's. Eventually, because God walks us through the process, guys, but it is for our benefit. When we abide, God produces forgiveness, enabling us to forgive others and ourselves. Yeah. So the second fruit of abiding that we want to talk about um, is a little lighter and <laughs> a fun one, I, one of my favorites to talk about, and it's actually unity. And um, you don't have to look very far in the world right now to see division and disunity. You can see it in the country. You can see it in our schools. You can see it um, in relationships, even in our households sometimes, right? Why are we so concerned about disunity and division? Well, I want to take you back to why God cares, what God has to say about it, because it's so important to him. And if you look in Psalms 133, the Bible actually says that where there is unity, God commands blessing doesn't suggest it, commands it. Not just for the lucky few, he commands it, guys. And then in Proverbs 6, we see the other side, and he says, one who sows discord or disunity is an abomination to God. Let that sink in for a minute. I don't know about you, but I would much rather be on the side of receiving his blessings and walking in that than being an abomination to God. Um, So what exactly is unity? If it's such a big deal, let's talk about that. The Bible speaks of unity as oneness with each other through the Holy Spirit. It's kind of like being on the same team with the same goals, the same purposes. It's knowing and pursuing God's will because we trust that it is best, none better. And this is super, super cool. (laughs) In Ephesians 4, we are told that there is one body, one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, What that means, guys, is that there is one Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that lives in me, lives in Dan, lives in Matt, 
lives in Travis, lives in you. There is not a junior Holy Spirit and a senior Holy Spirit. It is one stinking Holy Spirit, okay? So, so cool. And that means that if Dan and I are even trying to make big decisions, and if we're abiding and we're seeking God's will, he's not going to tell Dan one thing and tell me something totally different, right? He uses unity, the gift of unity, to actually confirm his steps and how he leads us in his direction. So uh, we see this all the time, and and God brings us unity in in decisions. It's been hugely useful. Um, But several months ago, we noticed we had gotten a little lazy in this, and we had Mm -hmm. kind of fallen back into some old habits, making decisions on our own, not coming together uh, to, to seek unity. Um, Kathy was praying about that and, and God emphasized to her that, you know, we needed to put priority back on that. And, but he gave us a great process for that. So every Saturday, um, we have breakfast together. That's our time together. And we use that time to, to talk about where, where we've been abiding. But God told us, uh, don't worry about any diets you're on. Go ahead and, you know, have a good breakfast. So there's bacon, there's waffles. It's a, it's a good time. (laughs) Um, and that's just our special time together, and we can share you know, what we're praying about, what God's telling us, verses we're in, uh, questions we mm-hmm. have, so Kathy can be abiding on those for me and vice versa, uh, you know, scriptures that we're in, uh, and it's just been a really great time. Yeah, so abiding together and relying on the Holy Spirit to bring us to unity can be a game changer in relationships, um, both in decision making and honestly in diffusing fights. It reminds us that we're on the same team, and ultimately what we really both want is God's best, right? So if we're in disagreement, we don't have to let it ruin our day. We know he simply hasn't revealed to us his will yet, and that's a powerful place to be. If we're both seeking God's will, we can trust that one of three things is going to happen if we're disagreeing. Either God's going to change Dan's mind, my first choice, um, <laughs> or God's going to change my mind. I'll let you know when that happens. Um, or, or God presents a whole new thing we haven't even thought about yet, um, which happens a lot, to be honest. Um, but the thing is that it's not negotiating. It's not compromising. Those things actually are a little bit of a cop-out. It's staying with asking Jesus and seeking his will until he gives us the, both the same answer, because we trust that's best, none better. And for those of you who are joining us Wednesday night for the marriage night, we're actually going to put this into practice a little bit. Um, So that'll be fun for you guys who are with us. But I just want to emphasize here, we live in a world with division and among Christians even right now, and it's ugly. But we need to recognize that division is actually a strategy of the enemy, and there's a reason why it's a strategy of the enemy. If we look at John 17, um, John 17 in this passage, Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he is praying just before he's arrested. And he opens up the chapter praying for himself, a prayer of surrender. And then he prays for the disciples. And then the last section of his prayer, the last thing he prays before he gets arrested, is he prays for us as future believers. And listen to what he says. In John 17, 20 to 21, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That's us, guys that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us so that, so there's a reason here, pay attention to it, the reason he wants that unity is so that the world may believe that you have sent me. When we as Christians get unity right, guys, the world sees Jesus. Unity through the Spirit is a big, big deal. So there is this quote that I love to share because for me, I'm a very visual person and this gives me a vision of what unity really looks like and trying to go to unity in the spirit. And it's from A.W. Tozer and it says, has it ever occurred to you that a hundred pianos all tuned to the same fork were automatically tuned to each other? They are in one accord by being tuned not to each other, but to another standard by which one must individually bow. To be unified together with Christ at the center, we must tune ourselves to Christ, not to each other. When we abide, God produces the unity. Uh, the next fruit we want to talk about is, uh, is joy. John fifteen eleven. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. So God desires for us to live joy-filled lives. 
Um, joy, again, is contentment in God, not in our circumstances. Uh, Jesus says that my joy may be in you. So how do we get Jesus in us? So that's something God's still working on uh, with me, and, and that's okay. I just need to stay connected and keep, with the pro- uh, keep uh, spending time with him. Um, so we talked earlier about you know, him revealing to me that, that my joy gets shaken very quickly due to my circumstances. Reveals that to me, and then he wants to start working on that in my heart. So I'm spending time with him, and he, show, he first reveals to me areas that cause me to, to lose my joy, circumstances that disrupt that. And then he starts giving me scriptures uh, to combat that. And it's been really neat. So um, when I have a big decision to make, that, that can impact my joy. But he tells me, he will give me his wisdom, James 1.5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let, let him ask God who gives generously. When I screw something up, I can, that can impact my joy. And he says, no, no, I'm going to redeem those mistakes. Who redeemed, uh, Psalms 103.4, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. I worry about the future. I can let that impact my joy. He says, no, no, I have what's best for you. Isaiah 45.2, I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass. I will cut and sunder the bars of iron. Um, when these circumstances come up now, he brings those verses to mind and, and, and keeps my joy going. There's, he still has work to do, and I know that, um, but if I just allow him, I know he's going to get me there. Psalm 1611 says, uh, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. When we abide, God produces joy. Yeah. So the next fruit of abiding is another one of my favorites, and it is simply being led by the Spirit. The Bible tells us that when we become Christians, we're given the gift of the Holy Spirit, and he resides in us. But if we're honest with ourselves, that can, I don't know, sound a little crazy or even a little creepy. I mean, what's he doing in there? I don't know. Um, (laughs) But scripture is so clear about the job of the Holy Spirit. And even Jesus said, it's better that I go away so that you can have the Spirit, right? In John 16, 13, um, Jesus lays out the role of the Holy Spirit so clearly. So listen to this. It says, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, meaning, by the way, he's hearing that from God, he will speak and he will declare to you the things that are to come. According to this passage, the role of the Holy Spirit is to guide us into all truth and even alert us of things to come, guys. Has anyone here ever gone to a museum? Right? Okay, yeah, lots of people have gone to a museum. Awesome. Sometimes you can find that super overwhelming, right? Or if you're like me and you don't get a guide sometimes, you just zip right through only to find out everybody that was with you saw all these magnificent works of art you didn't even know existed, right? But when you hire a guide or you go with a guide to a museum, they know everything about, they know where the hidden treasures are, they know the backstories, they know what's around the corner, they know how to take you to the spots where the richness is, right? If you hired a guide, though, and that guide handed you a pamphlet or handed you a map and said, good luck, would you think that guide was very good? No, you'd probably get on Google, give them a really bad review, right? But sometimes, don't we think that God's like that? That he handed us a Bible and he said, good luck? That's not it at all, guys. He gave us the gift of the Holy Spirit to lead us. And when we abide, we enjoy the fruit of being led by the Spirit. The next fruit is uh, character transformation. So Galatians 5, to 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. So again, this is a fruit of the Spirit. Um, it comes from spending time with God. We try to work to be more patient. We, we will ourselves to have more self-control. We all know that's temporary. Even at best, it's temporary. Well, it doesn't right? go very well. It doesn't last. Um, when we abide and surrender, he transforms our character. When we spend time with him, we begin to look like him. It's like walking through a smoke-filled room. When you get to the other side, you smell like smoke. 
Uh, the other one I like is Kathy's from the South, and when she spends any time with her Southern friends, that Southern accent comes back uh, really strong. Yeah, I'm pretty sure if you locked Sheila Boyd and I in a room for five <laughs> minutes, all the y'alls, all the fixins, all the stinkins will come right back out effortlessly because there is truth to the fact when your mom told you years ago that the people you hang around you end up looking like sounding like smelling like that is true about Jesus too guys when we hang out with Jesus we start looking more and more like him Amen. Uh, remember we don't try to be more uh, of anything Hebrews 12 1 to 2 says that Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith if he speaks it he will complete it we just need to be willing to stay with him and allow him to complete the process. When we abide, God transforms our character. Yeah. So there are so many other fruits of abiding. We just hit on, on five of our favorites this morning. But there's so many more we can't really cover in one sitting. Things like um, prophetic insight and alerts from God. Answered prayers, even the, delight, the, the desires of your hearts. Just last week, if any of you saw the one o'clock service, I loved this. Matt was doing an intro with, um, with his son Jacob, and in that, he surprised Jacob and told him that he had gotten tickets to the Celtics game, <laughs> and um, that he had gotten tickets to the Celtics game, and Jacob was so excited that he got to do that. What you guys probably didn't see, though, is right after that, Jacob runs back to Matt's office, and he's so just bouncing off the walls, and he sits down, and he's like, guys, I was praying all week long that God would find a way for me to go to that game. So think about how personal, how sweet that is. God took that moment, that gift of tickets that he had to ins you know, inspire someone else to give away. He took that and he used that moment to grow Jacob's faith, to grow his faith in answered prayers and to show him, hey son, I delight to give you the desires of your heart. That's who our God is, guys. He produces fruit in, of a faith in ways that we could never do on our own. So all of us would like to see more fruit in our lives, right? Yep. Yes? Okay, yeah, so we're all on the same page. We are wired to want to be fruitful, so how do we practically step into this? Um, again, last week we left you guys with some tools, and we don't want to turn this into a process at all, so please do not hear what we're saying, but we do want to give you tools. Please Just do not hear what we're not saying. That, yes, do hear They're what we are what saying. saying. <laughs> <laughs> so, but don't hear what we're not saying. It's not a process. It is not check these boxes and you will this. It is connect with the Father and He. He will this. So make sure you know that. But um, we do want to give you some tools just to help you in connecting with the Father. So quick review of some of the things we shared last night or last week. Um, last week we talked about Matt's acronym that he has taught everybody on Prowl. It's a great way to spend time in God's Word. Pray, read, observe, write, listen. We also talked about the effectiveness of journaling, writing down what God is saying to you so you can go back and, and he can use that to help you connect the dots. Also a great place to just question and dialogue with him. Um, digging into the Greek and the Hebrew and even different translations, using a Bible app, super easy to do, and I'm not even good at technology, so I can do it. Um, but that can give you a fresh take on his word and just some new insight. And then even accountability, and I'm hoping some of you guys used that this, this past week when you were spending time on in God's word, just sharing with other people what God is speaking to you. Um, and you'd be surprised how much he can use the people around you to help grow and give more insight and just make it come more to life for you. So a few more tools we want to give you this week. Um, that are some of my favorites. One, this is the teacher in me, so, you know, bear with me, but writing out scriptures. When you're spending time in God's word and something really strikes you, take the time to write it out. There is actually something from an educational standpoint that neurologically transpires when you have to hear something, read it, and write it out that will help you to process it more clearly and to internalize it more. So bother to do it. It's worth it. Um, Cross-referencing is another really fun one. 
I, he laughs at me. The things she thinks are fun <laughs> crack me up. <laughs> but, but it <laughs> she is. She thinks math's fun, by the way. I, I do that too. But anyway, <laughs> um, cross-referencing really is cool because what's cool about that, you can use an app. It doesn't have to be to it's totally intimidating. If you have a cross-reference Bible, great tool. You can just do it on your phones too, though. And if you hit a scripture that you've got a question about or it's just really speaking to you and you cross-reference it, you can see all the other places in the Bible that God actually talks about this very same thing thing. And that can give you so much more insight and sometimes even apply it to a situation that you relate to better than the first passage you were in. And so it does, for me, it it helps it come to life and I can see a little more of how important it is to God when I see how many times he's talked about it. Um, Another one I like is memorizing scripture. And I know I just got a lot of eye rolls with that one. But Memorizing scripture can be so important, and I'm old now. I, my memory is going. It is so lost, and so I get it. I get it's hard, but the reality is that memorizing scripture gives God vocabulary to speak to you, okay? It's important. So what do we do if we have really bad memories? One tool I love to do is simply write it out on an index card. People find what works for you. But I like to write it out on an index card. I had a friend who told me, you know, stick that index card, if you're memorizing the verse, right next to your bedside and read it the last thing before you go to sleep, first thing when you get up in the morning again, and when you're not distracted, the Holy Spirit has a way of working that into your mind and heart. And I was a little skeptical, to be honest, but... To be fair, it works. It actually (laughs) helps me in my memory. So that's pretty cool. All of these tools can provide ways to look at God's word and just to help you start moving things from head knowledge to believing it to actually experiencing it. And that's what we want to do, right? So we want to double back uh, and emphasize one last point. So bearing good fruit requires pruning. Mm -hmm. John 15, 2 says, Every branch of me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. So I'm going to word geek on you guys one more time, and then that's it, I promise. But I think you'll appreciate it, so hang with me. Years ago, when I was digging into this verse, I was struck by the thought that it says he takes away branches that don't bear fruit, and he prunes branches that do bear fruit. And I was like, I'm not much of a gardener. In fact, I pretty much kill everything I touch. But... (laughs) um, To me, those things sound the same, so why in the world phrase them differently? And so I went back and I looked at the original words to see if I was missing something, and I love what I found. The first phrase, when he says he takes away what isn't bearing fruit, is actually the word eros, which literally means to dig up and to cast off. Guys, in a vineyard, the vine dresser, when he prunes and he digs up and casts off, he actually burns those things so that they don't take root again. Somebody needs to hear that today. There are things he wants to dig up out of your life and get rid of and burn so they don't take root again. And then the second word, though, for prunes is similar, um, but it's got a slightly different meaning to it. And it's actually catharos, which is actually pruning to make pure. And it's cutting off some of the good things so that there's room for what's very, very best. So... Pruning can be painful and, mm-hmm. and difficult. Um, we've, probably had, <laughs> we've probably had relationships in our lives that, that were important to us that God has, has pruned away. That's hard. Um, something we were doing that, he, that we were enjoying, he's dug up and cast off because it wasn't leading to abundant life he has. So let's be honest, that, that can be tough, it can hurt. Um, we have to trust the process, we have to trust God, we have to surrender to his will. He will prune our, wife, our lives and walk us step by step into his very best for us. So, uh, again, we got a couple exercises. So if you guys can grab the, the cards in your seats. I'll be Vanna for a minute. <laughs> it looks like this. So the first one is, is uh, the principle of pruning. Now, let's keep this straight. You know, God does the pruning. That's, that's the process of God. But we can take that example and um, we can apply it into our lives and we can seek God's wisdom in creating margin. There's probably a lot of people, if not everybody here, you're doing too much. So we want you to go through this exercise of, of trying to create margin. Um, it's kind of the same principle where we're seeking his wisdom um, and, and creating margin so you have more time for abiding. Remember, if you are too busy to enjoy time with God, you are busier than he intends you to be. Yes, yeah, so that, that creating margin exercise that we have there is just to help you look at your calendars and really take it to God and say, hey... I know it's important to spend time with you. 
how do I make this happen? And surrender that to him and let him walk you through it. So it's a great process. Spend some time on it. The second exercise we have on the card is a fruit-bearing exercise. And this is just to help guide you. You may already be sitting here and knowing, you know, God is speaking on my heart right now. Forgiveness. I want to grow you in forgiveness. Or, man, I really want you to discover the fruit of unity. You may already know that. And if you do, pay attention to that because that's going to steer you through this exercise. If you don't, you can pray and God will reveal to you the fruit he wants to produce. Remember, it's his choice. The point is stay with it and let him do it. So trust the process. Go ahead and and spend some time on that and then let that lead you, whether it is a week that you spend on this with him producing this fruit in you or six months of him spending or like for me, years and years as he continued to grow this fruit in forgiveness. Um, But finally, just a word of encouragement as we wrap up um, for you to go on this week. I don't know about you guys, but sometimes I have a hard time getting rid of something that is broken. I tend to look, anybody else do this? I tend to look for ways I can patch it up or make it limp along a little further or task Dan with replacing a part to make it go a little further, um, whatever that is. And Dan, however, is really quick to see when something just plain needs to be replaced. Too often, guys, we look in the mirror and we see our brokenness. And we try really hard to fix it. We try really hard to patch it up, to make it limp along a little better because we got to make it through, right? But that's not how God does things. Listen to this passage from Isaiah that describes Jesus. Jesus actually quotes this passage in Luke in his very first public sermon. Listen to what it says in Isaiah 61, 1 to 3. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me, Because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort those who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion. And then I love this part, guys. To give them beauty instead of ashes to give them joy instead of mourning. He's replacing, guys. He's replacing the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Guys, Jesus doesn't just fix what was broken. He replaces it, and he makes it totally new. This is who Jesus is, and the key starts in abiding with him. And if you don't know him yet, let me tell you about my Jesus. (laughs) I do love that song. But he is loving. He is kind. He heals the brokenhearted. He redeems. He restores everything we've messed up when we lean in. He meets us right where we're at. He forgives us, and he walks us into a life filled with hope into a life filled with freedom. And that's what he has for each and every one of us when we choose him and when we choose to abide. So we're so excited to see how God brings true and lasting fruit into each of our lives um, as we learn to abide in him. Uh, Thanks for letting us share with you uh, all and uh, love you guys and have a great week. Thank you. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions, email info at netcastchurch.org. We'll see you next time.